Welcome to Writers Talking, the podcast where we take writers and readers behind the scenes, sharing the stories within the stories. No scripts, no filters, and no holds barred as we talk about what really happens for writers as they write, edit, publish, and promote their work. Hi, I'm Anjanette Fennell, agent, editor, and writerly mentor who's worked with hundreds of writers to break through their creative challenges to uncover the stories they feel compelled to share. Now, let's get talking. Nina D. Campbell is passionate about words and women's stories. She studied theater and literature at university, where she's held the position of women's officer alongside notable South Australian feminists Natasha Stott-Despoja and Annabelle Crabb. As a professional writer for the Australian government, Nina wrote ministerial speeches, briefings, policy papers, and communications materials before a midlife health challenge reminded her that life was for living, not just earning a living. Having left the paid workforce, Nina now writes fiction full-time. Together with her partner Bruce and their spirited Jack Russell Terrier Molly, she lives nestled between a world-class wine region and the sparkling sea in South Australia. Nina's debut novel, Daughters of Eve, is described as an unputdownable feminist revenge thriller. It was included in the Sydney Morning Herald's list of books to look out for in 2022, and Marie Claire's top 10 reads upon its release. Emma Gray is a novelist, feature writer, photographer, professional speaker, and accountability coach. She's been writing fiction since she first fell for Anne of Green Gables at 14, and is the author of the YA novels Unrequited and Tilly Maguire in the Royal Wedding Mess, as well as I Don't Have Time, co-authored with Audrey Thomas, and the parenting memoir Wits End Before Breakfast, Confessions of a Working Mum. She wrote her first adult novel, The Last Love Note, in the wake of her husband's death. It's a fictional tribute to their love, an attempt to articulate the magnitude of her loss, and a life-affirming commitment to hope. Emma lives just outside Canberra, where her world centers on her two adult daughters, young son, loved stepchildren and step-grandchildren, writing, photography, and endlessly chasing the Aurora Australis. Victoria Perman is an Australian Top 10 and USA Today best-selling fiction author. Her 2022 novel, The Nurse's War, is out now. Her 2019 book, The Women's Pages, was an Australian bestseller, as were her novels, The Land Girls and The Last of the Bone Gala Girls. Her earlier novel, The Three Miss Allens, was a USA Today bestseller. She's a regular guest at writers' festivals, a mentor, and workshop presenter across Australia, and has judged the fiction category for the 2018 Adelaide Festival Awards for Literature and the 2022 ASA and HQ Commercial Fiction Prize for an unpublished manuscript. And so I'm the debut. Emma's the has had a break between books one and two and three in the fiction world and has moved from YA to adult. And you're the quite consistent and very methodical. So really looking forward to finding out how you manage that gap between being an author and being a, a writer. Yeah. If you do. Yeah. <laughs> no, pr- <laughs> no, no um, pressure. How do you handle that? No, no, no. <laughs> It's really interesting to talk about these things because it, I, I have a great community of writers. I, I started off writing romance and so, and I'm still a member of Romance Writers of Australia. And through that, it's the most feminist organisation I've ever been a part of, wow. I have to tell you. It's, it. uh, there are a few men writing romance. Uh, one or two come to conferences, but it's all women. Everyone who publishes us is women. And the men run the companies, but that's another thing. But so it's this community of women and it's a community of women readers as well. So it's a great place. And I talk to those author friends of mine all the time uh, about things like this, about career starts, career lows, about ideas, about inspiration, about plotting, about all these things. So it is a really interesting discussion. And I, I think I'll preface by saying it's almost 10 years since I signed my first. I'm thrilled that I have had longevity. Um, but I, that's given me some perspective, I guess. And I'm really lucky that I'm still being, but it's been a lot of hard work. And part of that is being older when I signed my first contract. So I was 47, I mean, I'm 57. I'd had a career, um, I'd had a number of careers before, but I've always been a professional writer. So that was a muscle that I had really exercised well, different, different from writing novels. And I guess I was older and I was ready ready to say that I was an author I don't know I don't know how old you are Emma you're looking 30s maybe I love, oh, I love that again. yeah <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
<laughs> must be a trick of the light. No, I'm nearly. <laughs> I'm turning 49 in a couple of weeks. Oh, jeez. Well, you're you holding up well, sister. Um, <laughs> but I suppose, uh, and I know, Nina, you're about my age because we've had that, we've had the conversations and we've got sort of a shared sort of social history and we've been around the same things and movements too. But I don't know whether it, it was that, that mm. if I had started off really young and been signed, then I might have felt that pressure about, well, do I really call myself an author? Or, But I was ready to be. I've wanted this since I was 15. But it was a dream I put away for a really long time because I, I was the first person in my whole extended family to go to university even, and I, I studied journalism. So I didn't know anyone. I didn't know an author. I didn't know anyone to be published. I was an avid reader. But it was just a dream that was... Can you tell me, what, what were you doing just before? Because I think unlocking some of that... it. Several ideas occurred to me as you said that, like maybe some of it is what topic, like how close to home is it? Or were we, there's always truth, but were we fictionalizing it? So it was sick. Like, what do you think got you not just age, but of course, wisdom? We care about things in our 20s and 30s that we don't have any time for. By and the time I mean, the wisdom that comes with age. Very yeah, great. right. But it's, it to me, is more than just. The wisdom, it's a real stepping in. So there are things we don't care about, but other things, especially if you dreamed of it since you were 15. I know Emma has a similar story. I don't know if we've talked about that, about the age you started dreaming of it, Nina, but there's a difference between not caring about certain things and letting those go and caring a bit too much because then uh, it feels, I don't know, scary to ad admit it to ourselves. And in Australia, it happens everywhere, but obviously I'm not from Australia originally. You can't big note yourself, mm. right? So how does how did you get there? Maybe there was something in what you were doing before that first contract where you thought, no, I'm going to own it. I am very proud. I worked very hard. <laughs> it is my time. Uh, well, I, I call it my midlife crisis. <laughs> Honestly, it was, I was 47 and it was a standing joke with my husband and me. We'd walk into a bookshop and I'd say, why aren't my books on the shelves? And he'd say, because <laughs> you haven't written it yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and it came to a point where I mean, we've, we have three children who are all in their mid to late 20s now, but it was a point of like, three kids that I didn't have time. I worked full time, three kids. I just had to put the dream, you know, you can have it all, just not all at the same time. Mm. So I put that aside. But when my youngest one was 12, I could shut myself away and have me time again, whether, you know, sometimes for me it's sewing or going to the movies or whatever. But that was the that was the age when I could shut the door. They understood that I needed to not be interrupted for a little bit. And I had that I had the time for my dream, which for 18 years I had concentrated on family. That's that's just what you do. And my career. And I had I had a very successful career as well. But it it wasn't my dream. I would always work for, I worked in politics and communications, so I was always making someone else look good and I was writing speeches to make someone else sound good. Or, and in communications, I was drafting messages for someone else and I kind of thought, yeah, I want to do for me now. But it was that, it was the combination of the kids being older, that dream just sort of bubbling back to life and me thinking, if I don't do it now, I think I might have missed the chance. Now, that probably wasn't true, given I was seven. Um, it sounds so young. I know. It's, oh. <laughs> yeah, all the days. Um, but it was a combination of all those things. And the other really serendipitous thing that happened was a friend of mine got a job running the uh, Writers' Centre, SA Writers' Centre or Writers' Essays, and I'd never heard of it. And um, she came back from overseas and got this job, and I said, oh, what's that about? And she told me, and I went, oh, I might do, go and do a workshop, and that's what I did. So kind of I was actively, I had to actively pursue it. These things don't just sort of drop in your lap, I think. No, I think you're yeah. right, but it's it's really interesting that, like, I'm listening to a lot of the things that you're saying and I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah, I was doing that. I was doing a lot of communications work. I was doing a lot of writing for other people, a lot of speech writing. And and Emma, you were the same. You would, you know, you, you run a whole business that has a communications arm that you basically spearhead. But there is that. I think there's still that point at which there are some skills that you have to learn when you are the person standing at the front reading the speech or when you're the person who's actually promoting yourself. I think those are really a lot harder than we acknowledge. And I think publishing companies or if you choose a self-publishing road, 
the sort of things that exist to give you that skill set to market yourself are missing like this one giant component, which is how do you market yourself without looking like a tall puppy asking to have your head cut off? How, when you've only got this one book and you don't know how it's going to be received, do you actually get up and say to everyone, I'm an author. And I remember listening to a very prominent author at Writers Week actually say to the audience that she had met somebody who had said to her, oh, I'm a writer too. And she said, oh, what have you had published? And the person said nothing. And she said, uh, oh, well, we'll see then, won't we? (laughs) It was a literary fiction author. So that kind of bubbling underbelly that we didn't see in places like RWA or writer centres so much, but that exists in a lot of the literary world, that stuff, I think, can make you very reticent about standing up in front of or coming onto a podcast standing up in front of a library talk, talking to the media. I still absolutely, you know, radio journalists, I'm still very nervy around. I just don't know what they really want me to say in that that kind of four-minute gap. And I, as you can tell by the way I talk, tend to talk around things quite a lot before I get to the actual point. So You're not alone, <laughs> my lovely. <laughs> That's it. So there are like these skills that I think, you know, and they, my publisher, Alan Rumwin, gave me media training and it was fantastic. It definitely gave me a good step up on that. But the notion of just, it took me a while to work out what readers want to hear from me when I stand up and talk or, and you, Victoria, were really quite powerful in helping me understand that because it was being interviewed by you that actually gave me that sort of script, which I now take everywhere with me. And if anyone's interviewing me, I go, you might want to look at this. Yeah. Um, and they appreciate yeah. it too. They do. They do. Yeah. yeah. So it is, I think it's that thing of, I think, and I know when I look at other other writers, you know, and I sort of get the jelly legs and the, oh my gosh, that person wrote this thing, which really kind of touched my heart. Oh my gosh. You know, you get a little bit of fangirly sort of energy going. And then you have this realization that, oh my God, this person is talking to me the same way. How does that work? So there's that kind of nice people. And the the literary author who, you know, snubbed that friend of yours, she's just an awful person, (laughs) author or not. That's just rude. Yeah. That's an interesting one, isn't it? The thing about being a writer and, I mean, you hear it all the time in writers' groups where people say, oh, I'm, not a, I'm not a real writer, I haven't been published yet. And I have often said to people, if you write, you're a writer. Mm. There are a whole lot of people out there who don't identify as writers because there never occurs to them to spend their spare time writing because they're just not writers. And, and I mean, if, if you write, you're a writer, end of story. So, yeah, it, it's, oh, it's been fascinating listening to both of you speak. And I think I, I think I do resonate with this idea of the age thing, actually, because when I think about it in my case my first publishing deal I was about 30 and that was for a memoir and then my next book was non-fiction and then YA fiction and now adult <laughs> so it's also I think it's partly the age thing and then having a whole lot of life experiences then you know to do with family take up a lot of the time and energy of the next couple of decades but also it took a while to sort of find out what I want to write and to settle into the genre and that sort of thing so that's probably another aspect to it and and Nina I just want to say that we're all fangirling about your writing yeah. as well. <laughs> exactly um, <laughs> exactly yeah, literally other people telling me by the way this just short snippet because I hadn't said to you in person my stepmom read it number one she was in the middle of another book when she started Daughters of Eve and she stopped reading the other one because she couldn't not continue reading after the first page. And she said uh, once she'd finished, which didn't take her long, every time I looked at her, she was reading the book. She just said she was so incredibly impressed, not only with your writing, but the word choice. And she was trying to break it down for herself. So even though she isn't a writer, I found it fascinating because she was approaching that the way that we would, looking at a work and saying, wow, How did they do that? Not just, wow, it's a really great story, which she did, but she just was so impressed with your word choice, knowing I know that word, but I wouldn't have put that sentence together that way. To be able to hold those two things at once, number one, be fully enwrapped in the story, and number two, sort of just be fangirling the writing itself, that's huge. And she didn't have to, nobody, nobody is forced to read the book, really, (laughs) just a little arm bending, no. And now my dad, the ex-cop, is reading it. But absolutely, 
what you all have talked about, which I think is interesting, and Nina, you'd brought it up and, and we're coming back to this, which is there's the what we imagine it is like to be the writer of something that you admire. <laughs> and then there is the person, which is part of the reason for this podcast, meaning I've had the immense pleasure of meeting so many writers probably years ago. Yeah. When I was younger, I would have also fangirled myself out of reaching out to people. But then you get older and you think, well, I mean, what are they going to do? Say no or be rude. That's not a first. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've caught that before. But more often than not, like Victoria, you were just saying too, that literary writer was not a total aberration, but in the small minority. And yet that's what we fear. So we don't share it. What I want writers, whether published or not, listening to understand is you are so much closer to where you'd like to be than you give yourself credit for if you just keep working at it, right? Like your husband said, Victoria, you know, your book's not in here <laughs> because you haven't written it yet <laughs> or you that's haven't right. finished it yet. No, back then I hadn't written it yet. Yeah. That's so right. there you go. So I, it, it, it appears to me that there's this expectation. I love that publishers are giving their authors media training and that helps a certain component. What I would love is for all of you to, I don't know, fully assimilate the feeling. It's going to ebb and flow. Sometimes we're really in it and other times less so. But it's not a, oh, I've signed the contract. Now I feel like it. Now I feel like the author I am. And some people make that distinction too, that like I'll say I'm a writer, but I will only transition to author after X, Y, Z. There's a writer I know who has still stuck with nonfiction, extremely experienced. But when she and I were working together, she was going for her latest attempt at fiction. And I really wish she'd stuck with it. And I hold out hope that she will. But there was that discomfort there, right? She could own the nonfiction. That mm. was her comfort zone. Well, switching over to fiction felt a little bit more vulnerable. And so she was less willing maybe to take risks or put it out there that she wrote that. You've gone about it sort of the opposite way or just not all really. In. Just all mixed in. It, yeah, it's sort yeah. of back and forth, but it feels to me like you're getting closer to what you always wanted to write, even though a memoir feels like, oh, that must be the most vulnerable thing we can do. I mean, at the time, I'm sure it was, but now oh, that's it's not it's necessarily it. It's definitely fiction feels more vulnerable. And when I look back on it, the, the stuff I was writing before getting published was fiction. It was, it was always meant to be fiction all along. And I, I guess there's a perception, whether it's true or not, that it's harder to be published when you're writing fiction. I don't know if that's true, but that's just how I've sort of always imagined it. And, yeah, there's definitely an element of it being part of you that's out in the world, part of your personality, your innermost thoughts, you know, that the characters that you're writing are somehow part of you. And I guess, you know, that can feel a little bit, intimidating or a bit sort of scary at times but yeah I think it's just really we're the only people who ever have real really have access to our early drafts yeah. and the people we admire we're reading their finished book so if we were perhaps able to get a glimpse into everybody else's early drafts a lot of this would go away because it's just perception isn't it and perspective right. and eventually you're going to write a cleaner first draft. I'm not going to say that people don't write clean first drafts. I'm sure they do. And by the way, you're kind of one of them. You write, or <laughs> even when you turn in something in, you get that feedback. So some of it is craft, 100%. But that's not actually addressing that internal feeling, which you're... It's funny because I would say the, the opposite regarding memoir versus fiction, memoir specifically, maybe not nonfiction, but it's, we, we tell ourselves stories. I mean, look, it's literally what you are very, very good at <laughs> and I appreciate it. And sharing the stories, that's what people give you credit for, but you're also telling yourself stories. Again, one of the reasons we're, we're talking about it. It's really interesting. Actually, Victoria, maybe you can talk a little bit about it's specifically the genre like so obviously you're going from very 
I call it technical writing, but if you're writing communications in politics or, or things like that, it's very analytical. You would have taken some of that to your writing, but maybe talk about how you felt after you signed that contract. Was that first book historical fiction? No, I, um, my first book, I was contracted, my first three books for that first contract were uh, romances. Romances, yeah. Set romance. And I'd done a couple of workshops before then, but honestly, I just wrote them. I was involved with romance writers and I, there was, you know, the annual conference there is weekend, a weekend full of workshops. So I'd done those too, but I'm not trained in creative writing. I'm not a literary writer writer that's I'm a commercial fiction author I own that proudly yeah um, so it's a different you know I have a book a year so it's a different I'm not going to spend five years writing a literary fiction book that's just not what I do and it's not where I come from I like reading it it's just not me yeah. so um I guess I had the tools to write and this is the thing I had the tools to write and I had the discipline of deadline and I also was very happy to be edited because when you're writing for others you get edited all the time yeah once memorably I worked for a premier and I wrote a speech for him it was 28 pages it was to a, a group of business people it was about economics and, and I'd gone into all this great detail and he said oh I've got a speech here but I won't read it and it was a bit of drama on his part he had read it but he spoke off the cuff now that inured me to be sensitive about that stuff yeah. I wrote it but it was his and he could use it or not, but I had done my bit of the work. So I, I guess maybe journalism and politic, politics had always taught me not to be so sensitive. Yeah. I never took that stuff personally. Mm. Amazing. So I've never had a problem being edited. I love the editing process, mm. laborious and brain-numbing as it may be. <laughs> but I know that it makes a better, a better product. Well, it's a product. Let's let's not deny it. Maybe that that lack, not full lack, but there. When you were speaking, I just thought, wow, there's just not this attachment. You're mm -hmm. writing a thing, and you could really love it. Hopefully, you do, and you're mm -hmm. you're attached in so much as you cared enough. And again, I heard another interview where they said what we often say, which is you like to be obsessed with it because you're going to have to read it. And Emma's just been through this. <laughs> and Nina mentioned it again. It's like, you've got to be obsessed because you're going to be reading, you're going to be writing it, then you're going to be reading it. So many times you're going to be sick of it. So start off with at least that sense of fun and interest. Yeah. Right. And yet not so, and we usually say precious when we talk about editing that you won't take on this feedback. This is one of the benefits. If there is a real true benefit to working in a traditional publishing contract is that you've partnered with someone and you know that you're choosing the partner because you've signed the contract that they know what they're doing. They want to sell the book and they're going to make it the best they can make it. And therefore almost anything Thing, not everything, but almost anything they suggest editorially should be something you've got to give it a go. You can't just outright say, no, my character would never do that. You know, <laughs> it, that might be true. And all of you have been through that. That's part of that process. And so maybe just that understanding that somewhere along the way, maybe near the beginning, but certainly once you get to editing, you're giving it over and it isn't your baby. It is a product. Yeah. I've had this experience in a little bit of a different way too with one of my novels that was then turned into a musical. So it was it was the all the processes that you've mentioned, you know, it was Sorry, it, that's my bucket list. <laughs> 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 it's, it's just so exciting honestly um it's, <laughs> but it, it is um it was all of those stages of handing it over to the editor and of course you know and I'm totally agree I'm just I don't think there's a single suggestion I I refused actually in in any of the books come to think of it there may have been but I can't remember any I think I think you're handing it over to an expert who's got a very different skill set as an editor than they do as a, and then we do as writers um and just being too close to her own work you know but so there was the letting go at that point and then with the musical it was the handing over of the story to the composer who is a friend who I went to school with myself Sally Whitwell she's a, a dual aria winning composer so I had you know full confidence handing this piece of, of fiction to her and then she and I worked together on that and then we had to hand this over to the director of the show and that was just another step of, of, of stepping back and saying okay it's one step even further removed from us now and that was a, with a show that we were quite involved in at, in a high school in terms of developing it and the next step is now handing it over sort of in a more of a, a kind of licensed 
version mm -hmm. where we don't have it we, where it's sort of more hands-off entirely potentially on the on the creative side of things and so it's been this whole process of letting go letting go letting go again but in that in that process has been this joyous experience of watching what started off inside my head mm. get a life of its own out there and be take and you know I, I I'm still great friends with the young woman who played the, the lead role in the, in the high school musical that we put on who embodied this character almost more than the cat she was more cat than than cat was herself in the book <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I will always keep her in this special place in my heart creatively because she is the one that made me believe in my own character. It was incredible. It's actually, if you can let go like that, I think it can be an extraordinary experience. It's true, isn't it? I, like what sits really interestingly in my head when I look at it is two things. What you said earlier, Ange, about that thing where you think you'll feel differently after you've signed the contract. You think that there'll be this kind of, and it's the same as growing up. I remember getting mm -hmm. to 22 and going, oh, so there really just is no point at which you feel like a grown up. You just <laughs> always feel 14 or, you know, 12 or four, depending how big the monster is that's climbing out from under your bed. And, and realising that was a real liber liberty for me, that I didn't actually have to become another human being. But we do fake it really well over time. We kind of learn those skills to yeah. adult effectively in the world. But also what I was really interested with both of you is that notion of you have ego around yourself as an artist and you hold that space. So you feel comfortable with your authordom, you feel comfortable with your writing, but you have that beautiful egolessness around the actual work that you do. And I, I think that's really powerful. And I, I certainly... I was the same when I was going through the editorial process. What I loved was having what I felt was a partner who was saying, what about this, maybe if you did that, and helping me to see, take that first step away from the world being all in my head and me being the god of that world to the point where I could hand it over and have somebody else look at it and manipulate it and say, what if you went this way or did that or have you thought about that? And then I think that prepares you really well for when you hand it to readers and they mm take you know you've had this world in your head you've decoded it put it into words on a page they then recode it into an image or a world in their head that is not the same as the world you had in your head and so when you read reviews and people think differently about your characters or your world there's that kind of again that thing of going wow that's really interesting and if you get caught up in the ego of it and saying oh they have no right to think that that's my world but it's not the reader owns the world just as much as you do so does the musician that you know Sally and the great work that she did and the directors and each of the people like the audiobook I remember handing me the audiobook the book over to the audiobook narrator Felicity and she was just amazing we got to have a conversation and at the end she said you know I really don't want to disappoint you and I said you don't have to worry about that because this is no longer just mine it becomes yours too because you have brought your artistry to it and I think there's it kind of makes everybody feel like a family the family of that particular book or that particular story and I've always loved that bit of it so mm. yeah it's that thing of treading the line between having ego as the person who created and owning that and enjoying that and then letting go of all the ego that you do when you're actually working with the work. And maybe that's part of it. It, it occurred to me when you were saying that, would we be so, <coughs> so tied up if it was a cake we made, mm. a beautiful cake, and you made it and you think it tastes wonderful, but maybe somebody else, they have their own taste buds. <laughs> and the way they literally experience it is totally different. Some will love it. Some will go, meh, some, whatever it is, but you, you can still be proud. Show, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that cake analogy because, because <clears throat> it comes back to me to the question, why do you write a book? Mm. If you want to mm -hmm. decorate a cake, if you want to bake and decorate a cake and you want it to sit prettily on your kitchen bench and look adorable until it goes hard inside, <laughs> go for it, right? If you want to take it to a birthday party and everyone gets a slice, fantastic. But my dream was to be in Big W. Yeah. Mm. I was yeah. really, really clear about that from the beginning. Mm. I wanted to be able to make a living from writing mm. now 10 years on i'm kind of making minimum wage but you know <laughs> you keep it at it i have a husband who works and i'm going to be really you know blunt about that i couldn't i couldn't do this if i was on my own just my life right but i wanted success in some way and success is a, that's, a, that's a subjective um, mm. answer you know but but people buy my books and they enable me to have this life so that was always my dream i didn't want to write a novel that sat on my computer 
and was beautiful and untouched and unsullied yeah. by anyone else. Yeah. But if someone else wants to do that, that's perfectly their dream and they, they're entitled to that too. Mm. So I think it's that question, you know, why do we do what we do? Mm. If you and... want to write a family history and, and print 100, this is what I say to prospective authors all the time, what's it for? Are you writing the family history to print 100 copies or 50 copies and give to everyone at Christmas? Brilliant. This is You, do, you might do it a certain way. If you want to write a family history, which you think you want to have in the shops, well, then it's kind of a different thing. Mm. Yes. So I think it gets down to that question really about, do I have an ego about what I do? Absolutely I do. But I'm also an introvert, which may not be obvious. But <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you're in good company. I think all of us can yeah, chat a little bit. I'm an extroverted introvert. So when I'm not doing things like this with lipstick on, <laughs> I'm on the couch reading or watching Netflix or something. I don't, I, I like being at home. Yeah. Um, and I have to psych myself up to go on book tour and be up and be that person, which is authentically me, but it's a bit of me. That's it. It's exhausting. I think that's the thing too. It, it's yeah. how much it takes out of you. Oh, totally. To do that interview or, you know, go on TV, which is something I've only ever done once and I'm I've still, never done that. still recovering from it years later. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. I, I feel like here, you're putting a call out to the universe, by the way. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but you keep saying it. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I've read the book. Nina's read the book. Mm-hmm. I think you're kind of well placed to that might happen again. So we should do what we need to do to shore really? ourselves up for those things. The other thing is when you say that it's again, it's an all or nothing. It feels like, oh, I only am fully my writer self and owning it if I feel it all the time. We don't feel anything all the time, although tired is pretty mm. far up there <laughs> with <laughs> what I feel most of the time. But do you, do you see what I mean? It's it's these absolutes that we tell ourselves are part of it. But when yeah. we really I'm- crack into it, that's not what people experience, including some people that we look at and say, wow, they are so successful. Wow. Emma Gray has already published four books. Her fifth is coming out shortly. She's got this lick. She knows exactly what to do. Gosh, she's been on television on a morning show. <laughs> like easy for her. What could I possibly say to her? You know, but that's not your experience. Not right? No, no. But you can not. do it sometimes. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You went and you did it. Yes. And I mean, we can do hard things. We can. And I think it comes back to what we said in another episode when we were talking about how you then care for yourself and yes, in the recovery phase of anything that you've put yourself out there and done that might have felt uncomfortable. And I think too, anything like this probably gets easier over time. I know I, I remember the first radio interview I ever did. I would have been 30 because it was that first book. I was so petrified that I had to get my best friend at the age of 30 to come and sit with me in my house (laughs) in a phone interview because I was just so terrified. And now I love doing radio. So I've conquered the radio thing, but, you know, it's just a matter of stages. But that's just from being exposed to it more often. And I think if we hide from things, it just, it's, what's that thing? It, It, what we resist persists Persist. or expands, yeah. gets harder. Yeah, I think I think we can all just sort of learn from our own experiences in the past where things have seemed, I mean, we've all got things, even driving a car is a good example, you know, where it was in, at the time incredibly complicated to figure out. And we wonder yes. if we're ever going to get the hang of this. And, yeah. you know, now we can sing a song and talk and drive and we're not thinking <laughs> about it that way anymore. So I think we'll all get there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's about preparation preparation and and my job I was a media advisor too and you know no no minister premier business person charity head union boss would ever go out without being prepared yeah you know and that part of that was why people like me have jobs in the industry <laughs> because you you would sit down and pepper your you you would uh, my job was to write lines for people here are the things we want to say. Here are some possible responses to questions that you might get. Here's what else is also going on in the world that you might get asked about. And now I'm going to throw the questions at you and give me the answers and we'll see if we can work them out. So don't mm. think they do it spontaneously either. Mm. Yes. You know, Nina, you said you had media training. I think, you know, when we talked about your appearance at Unley Library, it was we specifically went through the questions so you would feel comfortable. And to me, that is a normal part of mm. being in public and presenting. And, and I do it to myself. I give myself lines, I write them, what the book's about. It comes easier to me because I think that way and I've prepared other people, but I still write lines for myself. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's the stuff that 
Yeah, I think that's the stuff that we need to prepare ourselves, like prepare debut authors with. I think we need a little bit more to give them a bit more structure, particularly when we have such a large cohort of indie publishers now where people are actually going out without the ability to get media training and things like that. I think we need to say, like, number one, as you were saying, Ange, tired. And as you said, you know, like... (laughs) just had no idea how tired I was going to get I got into the car drove off on a three-week road trip stopping (laughs) at bookshops sometimes four in a day signing books and talking to people and as an introvert who like you as a gregarious introvert was thought she was an extrovert for quite a while but you know loves nothing more than hiding under the bed covers with a book I I was just exhausted and I got to sort of Canberra and went no more no words no (laughs) people no just no and I was really disappointed in myself because I was thinking, oh my God, you know, there are four more bookshops. I should do those and I should do this and I should do that. And But I just sort of said, no, no, need to actually repair now, need to downtime now, need to. And that's the sort of stuff that I say when I talk to young authors who say, oh, you went on a book tour, what was it like? And I say, don't do what I did. Don't <laughs> hurry. Give yourself five weeks. Take but Nina, um, you, you travel with your partner? I do, yeah. Yeah. See, I travel with my publicist and that makes a big difference to have someone there. She will, when when I did a book tour in Melbourne this year, it, it she did everything. I love her, the teacup, polka <laughs> from HarperCollins, but she booked the taxis, booked the Ubers, the car cars, calculated the distance. And I just had to get in the car mm. and that's the only way to do it. And I'm in a privileged position where I get that support. Yeah. As I said, it's 10 years later. So please don't. I think, yeah, yeah, just keep oh, yeah. going. Just keep yeah. going. In 10 but years, it's, you'll get For that. the reasons you mentioned, it is exhausting to walk into bookshops and be up and say hello to people and they get sometimes they get a bit freaked out that you're there and they don't know what to say so you're making conversation and all that stuff you're you're performing and you're on it is exhausting Mm. yeah I think that's the thing that I wasn't prepared for and why I sort of still feel like I really love it I really enjoy that opportunity to talk to book people to find out what's going on but it is so much more exhausting than we think it is and Mm -hmm. I think that's a truth we need to share with authors to yeah to just prepare yourself like how you prepare yourself and then how you build those times in. So I was lucky I did have a few days here and there, but when I got home, I just, yeah, I didn't leave the house for at least a week or two. And I'm only just getting to the point, I think, where I can string words together cohesively enough that I can actually start (laughs) writing the next book properly because I've been kind of messing around the edges of it and trying Mm. to find my way into it. But the voice is, you know, you have to find that very particular voice of your character And so I've got, you know, quite a few pages that I know I'm going to be editing quite heavily at some point, but it is, it's a really, I think people don't realise just how exhausting it is, as you say. And so it's very heartening for me to hear someone 10 years in saying, yeah, it's hard. hard." The other thing is just that part of this whole thing, and you know, this is within my wheelhouse, is recognising yourself. So it doesn't have to be an either or, and, and it's all a learning. I mean, I could have told you for me, this is how I would have to do it. And then again, we get swept up and we think all the promo and you have to give yourself permission and it's not even stuffing it up. You have to give yourself permission to say, no, thank you. Or I can't look, you'll do it. Or your body will literally manifest something. If you don't call out and say, I need a break first for those writers who are extroverts, they may still maybe not to the level that an introvert does. And you know, there are extrovert writers. I'm sure of it. <laughs> I don't know that I've met them, maybe <laughs> ambivert, but even with all of that feeling good, again, if you haven't got a publicist with you, try to find somebody who wants to do that role and can handle those other things we usually call them mothers it's generally (laughs) women or wives they handle all the things for us so we can just show up and do our thing but figuring out where that is for you either by looking back at former experiences that you've had in your life if you've never had a book launch before and then learning and figuring out what way to do it because the other thing you'd mentioned Nina and it's absolutely true Uh, My hope for any writer is that longevity. If you want to write another book and you've signed with a publisher, they want you to write another book almost always. So figuring out what you can do and how you work best. It's not a right or wrong. Victoria, you've learned this is the way you can do it. You can do a book a year. This is your level of connection to it and your level of obsession with it. And then you're going to you're going to keep going. And that's amazing. And Nina, you are learning or have learned, ah, 
this is actually the way that feels best for me. And you've had different projects. So every book, by the way, can be totally different from the last book. If you want to be a working writer, regardless of whether it's minimum wage <laughs> or we want to get the pay up, okay, people, but to be that working writer, figuring out the best way for you, not to necessarily speed it up, but for you to feel less fraught about your process. So then you can sprinkle in other things if you need to. Nobody wants to write a novel that you felt forced to write. So if that's not how you write a novel, then doing other things, whether it's a partner who helps pay the bills or Emma's got this great other job. I mean, again, and all of her clients are amazing and wonderful. <laughs> and if you want to get your passion project out, it can be a juggle, right? When you're saying, I'd rather be writing this, but you've got those other things. They pay the bills so that you can let your heart sing this other song, you know, mm -hmm. during those other times, it's all just a learning and nobody has a, I've figured it all out. I'm done growing. I know exactly how it works. I had a, a conversation just recently, the podcast that will go out and a writer from writing book one to book two, the way she had to write was changed physically. She couldn't do it the same way. Things are going to come up. And the goal is you continue to bake your cakes. Cakes don't work as well for Big W, but I hear what you're saying, Victoria, because that's absolutely true. I want my product in Big W. So what can I do to make sure that I'm doing that, what I want, that's my goal, giving Big W and its readers what they want and doing it in a way that feels good to me, right? And authentic, mm -hmm. knowing I'm going to bump up against stuff. I, I might feel like I, I don't want to say fraud and imposter all the time, but it's it's just true. And to your point, um, some of it is working through it, exposing yourself to it or other things. Sometimes you'll expose yourself to it and learn. Yeah, actually, I just don't like it. It's not for me. Or that was a nervousness. And I'm, I'm a big person for reframing instead of anxiety, nervousness, I go excitement or high energy <laughs> because I experienced that. And so the reframe works for me, but it also helps tell me I want to explore that. I never would have done video before in my life. So many times I would have thought there's no way I'd be talking to these people. And I know people who are comfortable talking to thousands live in front of them, but does not want to go anywhere near a video camera. So we've all got our thing, right? It's about exploring what's the path of least resistance for you. And even better, what's the path that feels the most fun, right? What can I do to, to enjoy it? I'm still always going to remember your, your story, Nina, about going into a bookshop and having somebody who is not part of your primary market audience fangirling over you or fangirling on behalf of someone else. Right. But that's it. You are that person to them, <laughs> whether you accept it or not, they were having that experience before you even went into the bookshop. And it's, it is, it's really lovely when it happens, like, because it is a really human interaction. Mm. It's only after that you go away and go, it didn't just happen. That's crazy. At the time, it feels like such a wonderful, generous, warm connection, human connection. Oh yeah. <laughs> I went into my local Dimmix to order a book and they had to get it in and they asked my name and I said Victoria Perman and the retail assistant looked up and said, you mean the Victoria Perman? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh it was just one of the, it's just one of the lovely things about what we do. But, you know, I want to say to, to you, especially Nina, um, Emma, you've had more books published. And Nina, you're obviously writing yourself. You know how many people would kill their grandmothers to have a book published? <laughs> Honestly. And you have a book published. Yeah. And you have a contract for another, right? No, no, not yet. Oh, not okay. yet. oh she will. Yeah. She and, will. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to read it. You write it, they're going to read it. You know, mm. That is rare. So kind of enjoy it. Mm. You know, I, I, want, I want us all to go, we waited a long time for this dream. We were, re, writing is really hard. And you hold mm. a book with your name on it and you are the envy of 99% of other writers who never finished that book or whatever the statistic yeah. is. So, you know, let us, let's, let ourselves enjoy it and let ourselves revel in the fact that we have the skill to write a book that was picked up by a publisher, is on shelves and that readers fangirl over. Oh, my God. 
That's Amazing. so true. Yep. That's it. I will, I will do this. Maybe we'll wrap it up there because that was such a beautiful last message, at least for this podcast. Well, because let's be honest, every writer's talking could be a 24 hour sort of <laughs> process. If we could stay awake, we'd keep talking. But thank you so much, everyone, for being here and sort of diving in vulnerably to looking at some of these things that we're looking at each week. And I know that hopefully my fingers are crossed that we'll get to talk to each of you on another episode of Writers Talking. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Writers Talking. Join us next time for more writers in conversation as we delve into the writer's process, their passions, and a little bit about their books. Don't forget to subscribe on your fave podcast player and follow us on Instagram at writers underscore talking underscore podcast.